on World News Tonight. Raging wildfires. The western part of the US are burning away with homes destroyed by the fast-moving wildfires. A virus pass. The French parliament approves law requiring restaurant and travel COVID passes. Splendid splash. Disabled beachgoers get another chance to frolic in the waves. After bark. Pup tails now can be enjoyed with fluffy best friends. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Suzanne Shainali. A very good evening and thank you for joining with us on World News Tonight. And we start off today's coverage with the updates on the Olympics. Many games have kicked off since Friday and with no spectators, athletes compete with no live cheer. Reporting now from Tokyo is other than a World News Special Correspondent Rasita Chandradasa to give us more details on the games. Rasita? Well, Sonali, after the grand opening ceremony on last Friday, every sport are uh, happening all over Tokyo and the surrounding areas now. If you look at the, uh, the Olympic medal table, China opened the account on Saturday by winning a rifle shooting account. But the locals were cheering and joyful over their first gold medal, which was won by local hero Takato in the judo 60 kg category. And the, local, and the Japanese are expected to do very well in the judo event. That is one of their favorite pastimes and actually a sport born in Japan. We go back to last Friday about the opening ceremony. And people might wonder who was that lady who was lighting the Olympic uh, culture. She was Osaka Naomi, Naomi Osaka, as we would say. As we would say. And she's a four time Grand Slam tennis champion. And she's the reigning uh, US Open and the Australian champion, too. And, and it, was as a, it was a surprise, actually, why she was chosen to, uh, to lead the culture. But given her uh, stature, and her, uh, her defense on the LGBT and also the Black Lives Matter, some would say she was a natural choice uh, under the circumstances. Today I'm in the uh, uh, Tsurugasaki area where surfing making its Olympic debut after some would say 100 years that it was first requested to be added to the Olympics. The surfing event happens uh, in the life of the beautiful beach in Surugasaki, where dozens of athletes from all over the world, Australians, New Zealanders, Brazilians, Americans, and even the local boys, the girls and the boys are competing for Olympic, uh, Olympic medals. But unfortunately, as you can see, the tide, yeah, everything is tightly controlled and the security is really strict here. And through the no spectator nature, no one can even go to the beach. So the actual area where the event is happening is closed. So no one can enter. We can't even go at least to the close to that place. With all the events happening and the gold medals are given, we are looking forward to uh, all the events which would make this Olympic a true a goal, a global event. Over to Chanel. Thank you. That was other than a World News Special Correspondent Rasita Chandradasa reporting from Tokyo in Japan. With that, we are moving on to the United States as homes are destroyed as dry conditions and high temperatures create more complications with massive wildfires burning in the West. Homes and vehicles destroyed overnight as the monstrous Dixie Fly fire tore through this Northern California community. It's the largest wildfire burning in the state expected to reach 200,000 acres tonight. That's the size of all of New York City, with more than 5,000 firefighters battling the flames and thousands of residents evacuated. People are losing their homes and everything. The Golden State also fighting the Tamarack Fire near Lake Tahoe, both now contained over 20%, with four counties under state of emergency. The fire seems to be outpacing the efforts. They're spotting over a mile long. Tonight, 
85 large fires are burning across 11 states in the west with extreme drought conditions extending through the region. In Oregon, the bootleg fire is the nation's largest, torching more than 400,000 acres and destroying at least 67 homes, Gage Clark's among them. I came back thinking that I still had something to come home to, and when I got here I was actually kind of gut, gut shot and nothing left. But all eyes now on Montana, where more than a dozen large fires are burning and five firefighters remain hospitalized. Crews from California and Utah rushing in this weekend to help fight the flames. A united front against Mother Nature. While the U.S. is burning away, another part of the globe is getting washed up. Belgium experienced another bout of torrential rain over the weekend, the second blast of heavy rain coming just over a week after Western Europe was devastated by similarly powerful rainstorms. Just 10 days after Western Europe was slammed by the heaviest rainfall it has seen this century, Belgium endured yet another round of flooding Saturday as the country was slammed by heavy rains and thunderstorms. The floods mostly impacted the southern region of Wallonia, with the town of Denant seeing considerable damage, with cars swept away by flash floods. Luckily, despite the fresh wave of torrential rain, no fatalities have been reported so far. The latest round of flooding comes after earlier storms this month left at least 36 people dead in the country. Belgium held a national day of mourning last Tuesday to remember the people who died. The earlier round of torrential rain also left a trail of destruction in Germany with at least 180 people killed and almost 150 others still missing. The cost of recovery is expected to run into the billions of euros. In China, Typhoon Infa slammed the eastern region of the country with high winds and heavy rain on Sunday while other parts of China still recover from recent historic flooding. The latest rainfall in China comes after torrential downpours last week dumped a year's worth of rain in just three days on the central province of Henan, killing at least 58. China's meteorological authorities say that after making landfall, Infa will weaken, but could continue to impact a wide area of eastern China for days, potentially dropping heavy rainfall on areas still recovering from last week's flooding. Russian President Vladimir Putin warns of unpreventable strikes by the Russian Navy. The Russian president's warning comes amid tensions between London and Moscow after a British warship entered waters close to Crimea. Russian President Vladimir Putin warned on Sunday that his country's navy can launch an unpreventable strike if needed. His warning comes just weeks after a British warship sailed through waters off Crimea, angering Moscow. Putin addressed the crowd at a Navy parade in St. Petersburg on Sunday. The Russian Navy has everything they need for the guaranteed defense of the motherland and our national interests. We are capable of detecting any underwater, abovewater or airborne enemy and, if required, carry out an unpreventable strike against it. Putin's speech follows an incident in the Black Sea in June. Russia said it fired warning shots and had dropped bombs in the path of a British warship to chase it out of the Crimea Peninsula. Britain rejected Russia's account of the incident. Instead, the UK said Russia fired during a pre-announced gunnery exercise and no bombs had been dropped. Russia annexed Crimea from Ukraine in 2014. And the Kremlin says the warship entered its territorial waters. But Britain and most of the world say the waters belong to Ukraine. Tunisia's president dismissed the government and froze parliament, prompting crowds to fill the capital with support of the move that dramatically escalated a political crisis, but that his opponents call a coup. Police and protesters clashed in cities across Tunisia on Sunday as demonstrators demanded the government step down and attacked offices of Anahda, the moderate Islamist party that is the biggest in parliament. A spike in infections has aggravated economic troubles and exposed the failings of the squabbling political class. The protests, the biggest in Tunisia for months and the biggest to target Anahda for years, were called by social media activists. No political parties publicly backed the rallies. In Tunis, police used pepper spray against protesters, 
who threw stones and shouted slogans, demanding that Prime Minister Hisham Mashishi quit and Parliament be dissolved. The pandemic has hammered the economy, which was already struggling in the aftermath of the 2011 revolution that ousted longtime authoritarian leader Zine al Abidin bin Ali. <laughs> As a young man in 2011, this man says, I called for jobs, freedom and national dignity. Ten years on, he says he's still calling for the same things. Public support for democracy has waned amid surging unemployment and crumbling state services. The protests raise pressure on a fragile government that is enmeshed in a political struggle with President Kais Saeed and trying to avert a looming fiscal crisis. The latest on the COVID crisis right after this break, you're watching World News. Welcome back. France's parliament approved a law earlier today requiring special virus passes for all restaurants and domestic travel and mandating vaccinations for all health workers. To give us an update on this, we have other than in a world news special correspondent Chetana Dharmaratna joining us now from Normandy in France. Chetana. Yes, Shanali. Both measures have prompted protest and political tensions. President Emmanuel Macron and his government say they are needed to protect vulnerable population and hospitals as infections rebound and to avoid new lockdowns. To get the pass, people must have proof they are fully vaccinated, recently tested negative or recently covered, recovered from the virus. Paper or digital documents will be accepted. Lawn markers work through the night and weekend to reach compromise versions approved by the Senate and by the National Assembly after midnight. Macron appealed for national unity and mass vaccination to fight resurgent virus and lashed out to those fueling anti-vaccine sentiment and protest. About 160,000 people protested around France against a special COVID-19 pass for restaurants and mandatory vaccination for health workers. While Macron said, protesters are free to express themselves in a calm and respectful manner. He said demonstrations won't make the coronavirus go away. He criticized people who are in the business of irrational, sometimes cynical, manipulative mobilization against vaccination. Among those organizing the protest have been far-right politicians and extremist members of France's Yellow Vest movement tapping into anger at Macron's government. Back to Shanali. Thank you. And that was other than a World News Special Correspondent Chetan Maratna reporting from Normandy in France. New South Wales logged its second highest daily increase of the year in locally acquired COVID-19 cases amid fears of a wave of new infections after thousands of people joined an anti-lockdown protest. Australia's New South Wales reported this year's second highest daily COVID-19 case increase on Sunday. That comes a day after thousands of people gathered in Sydney to protest lockdowns. Those protests have stoked fears of a new wave of infections and threats of a longer lockdown in one of the nation's most populous cities. New South Wales Premier Gladys Berejiklian condemned the protesters. In relation to yesterday's protest, uh, can I say how absolutely disgusted I was? It broke my heart. Millions and millions of people across our state are doing the right thing. And it just broke my heart that people had such a disregard for their fellow citizens. Prime Minister Scott Morrison called the protests reckless and self-defeating. Millions of Sydney siders who stayed home, they're the ones who are bringing an end to the lockdown sooner, not those who are putting themselves at risk, those around them at risk, particularly the police at risk, and that was a very selfish act. New South Wales is struggling to control an outbreak that began in June, driven by the highly contagious Delta variant. But despite four weeks of lockdown in Sydney, the numbers remain stubbornly high. Overnight, New South Wales reported two deaths, including a woman in her 30s with no pre-existing conditions. State leaders have blamed the government for a sluggish vaccine rollout, owing to supply shortages and changing medical advice for AstraZeneca shots. To speed up the process, Canberra on Saturday updated its advice on that vaccine once again, urging anyone under the age of 60 to strongly consider getting vaccinated with it. It had previously advised against AstraZeneca for anyone under that age due to concerns about blood clots. 
We have some good news for you. Barcelona's Nova Icaria Beach is running a special service to allow disabled beachgoers to frolic in the sea. Seven-year-old Max has a huge smile on his face as his father carries him ashore at Barcelona's Nova Beach after a splash in the sea. Max has cerebral palsy and uses a wheelchair making beach trips difficult. But today he is using a special service run by the Barcelona City Hall which has helped thousands of disabled beachgoers. It includes amphibious chairs, purpose designed dressing rooms, complete with a lifting crane and nine specially trained lifeguards to help users access the water and enjoy the waves. Owing to COVID-19 restrictions, swimmers have to book ahead to use the service but they do not seem to mind. For the team, helping people to take a refreshing splash in the sea is rewarding. U.S. President Joe Biden approves a $100 million emergency fund to resettle Afghan refugees. The U.S. is preparing to ev evacuate thousands of Afghan special visa applicants who are at risk from the Taliban. U.S. President Joe Biden authorized up to $100 million from an emergency fund to meet unexpected urgent refugee needs stemming from the situation in Afghanistan as U.S. forces leave the country. The U.S. will begin evacuating thousands of Afghan applicants for special immigration visas who risk retaliation from Taliban insurgents because they worked as translators or in other jobs for the U.S. government after the 2001 U.S. led invasion. The first batch of evacuees and their families is expected to be flown before the end of the month to Fort Lee, a U.S. military base in Virginia, where they will wait for the final processing of their visa applications. The Pentagon said some 2,500 Afghans could be brought to the facility. Those who helped us are not going to be left behind. The Biden administration is reviewing other facilities in the U.S. and overseas where special immigration visa applicants and their families could be accommodated. Biden has set a formal end to the U.S. military mission in Afghanistan for August 31st as he looks to disengage from the conflict there. With the last U.S. forces on the way out of Afghanistan, Biden on Friday in a phone call with President Ashraf Ghani assured him of U.S. diplomatic and humanitarian support as violence has risen sharply and Taliban advances have piled pressure on Kabul. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. The European Union is sending four forest fighting planes to Sardinia in response to a request from Italy to help tame fires that have swept across parts of the island. Nine people were killed by a landslide in the northern Indian state of Himachal Pradesh as boulders fell and hit the vehicle that were travelling in. Over a thousand Filipino activists took to the streets of Manila ahead of Philippine President's sixth and final nation address. COVID-19 vaccinations for people in their late 50s have now begun in South Korea. Authorities want to up the pace of the the rollout which has slowed in recent weeks. U.S. Deputy Secretary of State met China's Foreign Minister to continue discussion on the two superpowers' unsteady relationship among such issues being North Korean threats. And finally tonight, a bar in London is serving up drinks to a new breed of booze hounds offering pup tails such as Bloodhound Mary and Barkerita to dogs brought along with their owners for a drink. After Bark is the latest venture from the Barkney Wick Dog and Human Community Centre situated in the capital's Hackney Wick area, long a haven for artists and alternative culture. Founder Jamie Swan said she believes their menu of cocktails and shareable snacks is unique, offering plant-based refreshments for those whom man's best friend can also be a drinking partner. Owners and their pets can also share a lick and mix treats made without sugar and salt. Sharing a social life as well as home time with pets is a way to ease the anxiety from the families that are feeling after the changes brought by the COVID-19 pandemic. For those who that think that whining and dining together is a step too far, the centre also offers dog care services and a cafe in the daytime until the doors to Afterbark open, which Swan hopes will offer a sense of community in part of the city accused of rapid gentrification. Well, that's all the news we have for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow with another edition of World News. I'm Suzanne Shanali. Until then, stay safe and have a good night.